one of the most wonderful teachers I've had has, has been an octopus. Some of you may know a book I wrote, um, The Soul of an Octopus, which came out in 2015. In this book, I got to get to know octopuses as individuals. I got to know the minds of mollusks. These guys are mollusks, like clams, like snails. And we don't think of them as having mild, uh, minds or souls. But getting to know them, and particularly Octavia, I can tell you that if I have a soul, she had a soul. Let me just tell you what it's like to meet an octopus. I'll tell you about my first meeting with the first octopus I ever met. Her name was Athena. She, if she stood up, she would have been maybe four feet tall. She weighed 40 pounds. And Scott Dowd, who worked in, um, not in Cold Marine where she lived, but down the hall because the regular guy wasn't there, he lifts up the lid to the tank. Octopuses need lids on their tanks because otherwise they'll get out and they will do stuff you don't want. They'll like dial Japan and leave the thing off the hook. No, act <laughs> They actually, they, they will get out of their tank and get into other tanks, eat everybody in there, and then go back to their tank. They are so smart. But anyway, I'm, I'm meeting Athena for the first time. He lifts up the lid of the tank. I see this beautiful animal turn bright red in front of me. She's red with excitement and emotion. I see her eyes swivel in its socket and lock onto mine. And suddenly she starts to... to ooze over from her lair, come out of her lair and come toward me. And the next thing I know, her arms are boiling up out of the freezing cold water and my arms are going in there to meet hers. And my hands and arms are covered with dozens of her silky soft white suckers. And she is touching me and tasting me at the same time. And I realize when I go home, I'm going to have to tell my husband why I got those hickeys at the aquarium. <laughs> But what was so obvious to me and so thrilling was here was an animal who is so distantly related to humans. You'd have to go back half a billion years to find a common ancestor. And that common ancestor, by the way, would just be a tube because nobody had eyes or hearts or anything complex then. Everybody was a tube back then. Um, <laughs> here's this animal who is so unlike us, you would have to go into science fiction or go to outer space to find somebody that unlike a human. And yet, that creature was just as interested in me as I was in her, just as curious. And we now know from scientific experiments that octopuses do, in fact, recognize individual human faces, and they have preferences for some humans, and they have memories that last a long time. And I experienced this myself with my dear Octavia, and I write about her as well. Octavia I met shortly after she came as a wild octopus to live at New England Aquarium in Boston. And at first she didn't want to have anything to do with us. But slowly I got to know her. Um, they, the way you get to know an octopus, they like to be stroked. They also like to be fed. Um, where is their mouth, you might ask. The mouth is conveniently located in the armpits, right there, where they have a beak like a parrot and venom like a snake and can shoot out ink like an old-fashioned pen. And these animals can change, as you know, color and shape. And I could see from when I got to know Athena and then Octavia, I could see different emotions on the skin of my friend. When they're excited, they're bright red. And then when you pet them, they start to turn white, which is the color of a calm and relaxed octopus. And they love to play with you. They love to play with the same toys our children do, like Legos and Mr. Potato Head. Well, I got to know Octavia so well that when one week 
I, I couldn't come. Actually, it was like two weeks. I couldn't come to the aquarium. And when I came back after that, we literally flew into each other's arms. We, were, we missed each other. It was really obvious. Other people saw this too. Um, we were very good friends. But octopuses only live three to five years. And by the time you meet them, they're already a year or two old. Well, Octavia was nearing the end of her life when she, like all female octopuses who live long enough, laid eggs. Here they are, hanging like strings of pearls. And this marked a huge change in our relationship because all octopuses, when, they, when the females lay eggs, they retreat to their den and they never come out again. They will not leave those eggs. They are cleaning their eggs. They're protecting their eggs. They're fluffing their eggs. They're using their siphon to hose down the eggs. They're using their arms. It looks like a woman vacuuming curtains. Um, she's all about her eggs. Now, Octavia could not know that her eggs were infertile. There was no Mr. Octopus, which was the problem. So month after month, she guarded those eggs. Now, a giant Pacific octopus in the wild, her eggs will hatch in about six months, depending on the water temperature. Well, six months went by, and she's still guarding the eggs. Seven months, eight months, nine months went by, and she was still steadfastly guarding these eggs, which are never going to hatch and are now beginning to disintegrate. And one day I noticed that she began to disintegrate too. She had a big swollen eye and infection, and Bill Murphy, who's the uh, cold marine senior aquarius, decided she should be moved behind the scenes. She should not have to be on display during this time. Because in the wild, at the end of their lives, they, they hide in their dens till they die. They use their last breath to blow the tiny baby octopuses out of these little eggs, each the size of a grain of rice, out of their eggs and into the open ocean. So he had to move her. Well, how do you move a giant Pacific octopus who's glued to her eggs? Well, remember, she'd been in her lair for more than nine months. Well, when Bill put his hand under her lair and touched her and she tasted him again, she recognized him and let him move her to a, a bucket and from the bucket to a place behind the scenes. And the next week I came in essentially to say goodbye to my friend. And I wondered, you know, it had been months and months since she'd looked up through the water at me. Would she remember me? Remember, they only lived three to five years. So <laughs> nine or 10 months to an animal like that is decades. Would she even recognize me? And since she was old and sick, would she even feel like hanging out with me? Well, I was shocked and deeply moved to see that when I took the lid off her new exhibit, she floated immediately to the top and reached out and held me. And I offered her a fish, but she didn't want the fish. She just dropped it. She just wanted to be with me one last time. And the lesson I think that Octavia has taught me is one that's true of all the animals that you can get to know, all of the teachers that are around us all the time. And this, I think, was best said, it's attributed anyway, to Thales of Miletus, a pre-Socratic Greek philosopher who said that the universe is alive and has fire in it and is full of gods. And what I think that means the universe is alive, that there are so many lives around us, vivid, incandescent lives that, that love being on this earth, that love their lives like we love ours. The universe is alive and has fire in it and is full of gods. 
To me, that says the universe is far more holy, far more worthy of our love, far more sacred than we might dare imagine. Our teachers are all around us to remind us of that daily and remind us that this earth is a holy place, a living place, and we owe it our reverence, our thanks, and our awe.